بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وبعد I start with السلام to everybody السلام عليكم ورحمة الله and I welcome everybody uh, to this second session of live streaming on uh, YouTube we ask Allah عز وجل uh, to enable us to make use of these means this technology to spread his word and uh, to enlighten ourselves and enrich our knowledge with regards to our uh, faith and religion. Last time we spoke about common mistakes people commit or fall into during Ramadan and today we're uh, allocating the time and specifying a lecture just for sisters because they have their own distinct issues that have to be addressed regarding to this act of worship. Uh, some of the, and again, we're continuing with mistakes that are commonly uh, committed or misinformation that people might have. Uh, the first issue is the issue of cooking and taste in food. A lot of sisters uh, feel that it is not something that coincides with the spirit of Ramadan or that it is not permissible when I am cooking to taste the food to make sure that it's something that's edible afterwards. Sheikh Ibn Jibreen rahmatullahi alayhi was asked about this issue and said that uh, it is not a problem, it is not a matter that invalidates the uh, siyam if a woman tastes, or a man for that matter, this is common between us and them, uh, tastes the food to see if it's too salty, if it's too sour, if it needs sugar, whatever the thing that she's cooking. Provided that she tastes it and then spits it out and she doesn't swallow it because taste buds are on the tongue, they're not in the throat anyways. So he said there is no problem and that does not invalidate the, uh, the siyam in any way. Now, pregnant sisters or breastfeeding women uh, find it difficult to fast sometimes because of their pregnancy or breastfeeding. They fear for themselves or the baby and therefore they don't know, can they break the fast because of this or can they not? Well, they can. And the issue of breaking the fast because of pregnancy and breastfeeding was addressed from, from the time of the companions. And Ibn Abbas radiallahu anhu said that a pregnant woman or a breastfeeding woman breaks her fast and later she doesn't even have to make up. All she has to do is expiate for every day by feeding a poor person. Now this is a matter of difference of opinion, I know. So, but this is the opinion I personally believe to be the sound opinion and this is what I practice in my own family. Now, there are sisters who do not intend to fast the following day if the following day happens to be the regular day of their monthly menses. So they say, okay, so I'm expecting it tomorrow. It's due tomorrow anyways. So I don't have to intend to fast because I'm not going to fast. Well, this is wrong. You must intend to fast. And if it so happens that you do receive your menses the following day, well, then that by itself invalidates your fast and the day is not counted for you and you got to make it up. So she must intend to fast and under the pretext of expecting the menses, you should not refrain from intending to fast the following day. Now, she received her menses or in postpartum bleeding after she delivers. The issue of holding the mushaf to the Quran to recite the book of Allah Azza wa Jal. Now this matter in itself is a matter of difference of opinion. Is she allowed to hold the Mus'haf or not? Should she hold it 
Or should she refrain? There, there are groups, uh, two different groups of opinion uh, of scholars. One group says she cannot; she is absolutely forbidding from touching the mushaf, and others say no, it is allowed. Now this goes further. Some say she cannot even recite it from memory, not, let alone touching the actual mushaf, the hard copy of the Quran. Now, uh, Ibn Taymiyyah rahmatullahi alayhi, he said that if she is going to recite it from memory, then that's not a problem. This does not go into the first issue. And he holds the opinion that a woman reciting it from her memory or from tafsir books, because this is not a Quran. For that, for English speakers, reciting it from the, the uh, translation of the meaning of the Quran that has the Arabic text, and on the side they have the, the translation or the transliteration of the uh, Quran, then that's not an issue. Now, here comes an issue with reciting the Quran from smartphones, from laptops, from iPads, from whatever, anything, any device. Is that allowed? Well, that's not considered touching the Mus'haf. The issue was with the group who said she is not allowed, she's not allowed to touch the hard copy of the Mus'haf itself. But contemporary scholars said that such devices, these smartphones and, I and laptops and, and iPads, and none of that is a Mus'haf. Some of them, I, I was discussing this issue with one of the scholars, he said these are digital, the, what you see on the screen is not the actual page, it's, it's binary, the 0, 1, 1, 0, wherever these binary uh, representations of this image. And therefore, a woman is allowed to uh, read the Quran either from her memory or from a device or from the translation of the meaning of the Quran whatever the language she speaks is. Now, some sisters, now we're in Taraweeh, doing Taraweeh at home because of this corona issue. And some, some sisters hold the Mus'haf whilst her husband or her son or her brother or her father is leading the Salah for no other purpose but to follow what he is reciting. In other words, it's not that he says, well, I need someone to make sure that uh, I don't make a mistake and if I do, correct me. We get the mother and the sister and the daughter and the father and the son-in-law. Everybody is holding a mushaf. And the imam is leading and you got a group of people. It's like a class, classroom with everybody holding a mushaf. This is not recommended because... It makes the person or it causes the person to abandon the sunnah of holding, putting the right hand on the left hand on the chest. And therefore, uh, if it's not done only by a person for the purpose of correcting the imam, if the imam makes a mistake, then it should not be done. Um, some sisters, when they receive their menses, they believe that since they or postpartum bleeding, the, the nafas, they believe that then since I cannot fast and I cannot pray, then I cannot do anything else. And she refrains from everything else. You still can do a lot, sister. You can ask Allah, you can supplicate, you can mention Allah Azza wa and you can recite the Quran according to the opinion we stated uh, earlier from a device or... You can do a lot. You can give charity. You can maintain ties with kinship. All of these are acts of worship that are commonly practiced by people who can fast and people who cannot fast for whatever reason, legitimate reason, they cannot fast. And therefore, don't refrain from everything and deprive yourself from a lot of good that can result from these other acts of worship. Now, some sisters start fasting because they're not sure. Now, it's the end of the period or the number of days that 
uh, she's used to in her, in her menses. And she's not sure if she has become pure and thus can, uh, needs to pray and fast or not. So she refrains from eating and drinking and starts intention of fasting without actually confirming that she is ritually pure. And this is not valid. If she does not ascertain by checking herself to make sure before dawn, regardless of how short the period is before dawn, if she does not ascertain that she is absolutely ritually pure and her menses has stopped, then if she fasts, it doesn't count and it's an invalid fast. Aisha radiallahu anha, and this is reported by Al-Bukhari, used to address women. The women used to bring the cotton after they had checked themselves and bring the cotton to, that, to, to Aisha radiallahu anha to confirm that the ruling is that, yes, you are pure, fast and pray. And she used to tell them, don't hasten until you see pure white a pure white color on the cotton, meaning the, the, the cotton has nothing, it's not smeared with any other color. And therefore, you, are, you become uh, ritually pure and you can perform the ghusl and pray and then you can fast even if you did not perform the ghusl. Uh, now, again, the, the issue related to the, the uh, monthly period. Some sisters uh, continue to fast and refrain from eating and drinking if she receives her menses just shortly before uh, sunset. It's as if she feels, you know, what a waste. Uh, the whole day I've been fasting and then now minutes before Maghrib, then let me just fast that. It's not, it's not legislated for you to fast that period, these minutes. You're not allowed because you're not fit to fast at that, at that period because you received your menses. And therefore, uh, as Shaykh Al-Uthaymeen said, even if it's seconds or minutes before Salatul Maghrib or before the sun sets or before you hear the Adhan, whatever the case be, then that day is invalid. It's gone and she has to make it up. It doesn't count for her. Now, some sisters, you know, before the, the sisters be, be, receive their menses, they, they feel things happening in their body. Some sisters, as soon as they start feeling these things, these changes, this movement, the movement of the blood, they immediately start eating and drinking without making sure that they have actually received their menses. Uh, and then, that's not valid. That's not allowed. Your fasting continues to be valid so long as you are ritually pure, for sure. And it does not become invalidated until certainty again tells you that you are impure and therefore you can break your fast. Uh, Shaykh al uthaymeen said, a woman is not allowed to break her fast just because she feels these feelings, the, the introductory feelings or changes in the body before she receives the actual menses. Uh, now, some sisters don't like to uh, waste these days or they feel that going through the menses of four, five, seven, eight, ten, some sisters have 14 days of menses. They don't want to lose that in Ramadan. And they feel that they want to enjoy the act of worship, the acts of worship. Uh, and therefore, they take pills that prevent menses from uh, happening or from coming. Uh, and some believe that this is not permissible. Shaykh Ibn Baz was asked this question. And he said, there is nothing wrong in that. Uh, however, it would be better for uh, the woman to submit to the decree of Allah Azza wa Jal for women which is receiving menses and then make it up later. But 
uh, if she does so, if she takes the pills uh, which delay her menses until the end of the month, then it's permissible and her fast is valid. Now, this was reg regarding the monthly period and the menses. Now, let's talk a bit about the postpartum bleeding, the, the, uh, the, naf the nafas blood. Some sisters mistakenly believe that this postpartum bleeding period must be a complete 40-day period. And therefore, they continue to eat and drink until they reach the 40th day. Even if the blood stops and they don't see any trace of it and they check and it's white, they think that this period is mandatory to finish, to exhaust before I actually uh, am obliged to fast and to pray. Uh, Imam al-Nawawi, rahmatullah alayhi, said, if she, if a woman becomes pure before that 40-day period, then she becomes obliged to fast. And Ibn Qudama said, there is no minimum for the number of days of postpartum bleeding, meaning the 40 is not a minimum. If she becomes pure in 20 days, in 15 days, in 30 days, then she is obliged to pray and fast. Okay. Uh, some sisters happen, it coincides that her uh, monthly period happens at the end of the 40th day. She finished the 40 days and then her period starts and then she starts uh, fasting thinking that this is istihaba. Istihaba is uh, irregular bleeding, uh, bleeding that's outside the menstrual period. This is what's called istihaba. It's not the normal uh, menses blood or postpartum, uh, postpartum bleeding blood. They believe that this is that and therefore refrain from praying and fasting and that's not correct. They must, uh, sorry, let me rephrase. I think I, I mixed it up. They, when the connection happens between their period and the, mens, the, the postpartum bleeding period, they think that this is istihaba and start fasting and praying. They should refrain from fasting and praying if that coincides with the... She know, every woman knows when her period is. She knows when it's due. Because they, they actually count it and they know. So if it coincides that the end of this postpartum bleeding happens just before a day before the menstrual period and the next day is your regular menses then refrain from drinking uh, from uh, fasting and praying and continue until you become uh, pure now some sisters the same scenario happens they continue to bleed or to see uh, darkish discharges after the 40 days of the postpartum bleeding. And it does not coincide with the time of her monthly period. And they continue to break the fast and refrain from praying. Well, that is another mistake. If it's not your period as the point before this one, then this is istihada. This is irregular bleeding. This is non-menstrual bleeding or blood. And therefore, you take a shower and you start praying and you start fasting. Now, some parents, uh, fathers or mothers, their daughter might reach the age of puberty young, very young, especially in hot areas like the Gulf, like Far East or in Africa or whatever. 
In hot areas, women happen to receive their menses or reach the age of puberty early. But some people, out of sympathy, and that's wrong sympathy in the wrong place in the wrong time, they do not uh, instruct their daughter to, uh, to fast under the pretext that she is still too young to go through the suffering. And they do not allow her to fast. Well, if she becomes or reaches the age of puberty at the age of eight, then it's your responsibility in front of Allah Azza wa Jal to instruct her to observe the fast of Ramadan. Otherwise, you have not fulfilled the trust Allah Azza wa Jal entrusted you with regarding your daughter. Now, this is a point that we've mentioned with regards to ritual impurity due to Janaba in the last session, which is a, uh, a the, the same thing happens with sisters. Now, sisters, some sisters mistakenly believe that if they become pure before Fajr, she's certain that she's pure, her menses stopped or her Postpartum bleeding stopped, absolutely stopped. She checked herself and the cotton is pure white, nothing, no trace of anything. And then she goes to have suhoor or before even she attempts to go to have suhoor, the adhan is called. She intends to go to, to fast because that's it, she's pure. So she's obliged to, to fast. But she doesn't have the time to perform her ritual bath or ghusl and she mistakenly thinks that since she didn't take the bath and become ritually pure and dawn started or the crack of dawn uh, did she did not perform the the uh, ghusl before the crack of dawn then that day is invalid and she eats and drinks that's wrong there is no connection between your ritual purity by means of ghusl and Initiate or starting to fast. That's only connected to the salah itself. You cannot pray. That's true. And that's correct. You cannot pray. You're not allowed to pray until you perform the ghusl and become ritually pure because that's a precondition for prayer. But it is not a precondition for fasting. And therefore, if a, a sister becomes pure for certain after she checks herself, before the crack of dawn and she could not perform ghusl before that and she hears the adhan or it becomes the times become due then she continues fasting she goes performs the ghusl prays and continues her day fasting and that's not a problem inshallah uh, these are some matters i uh, thought i would address for the sisters and uh, Today's session is shorter than last session. Alhamdulillah, I uh, didn't expect last session to be that long yesterday, but it was. So uh, we opened the floor for uh, the brothers and the sisters uh, to ask questions.